Well, thank you. The last speech on a long day of speeches, you're still here. You're the hardy ones. Maybe you have a problem, I'm not sure, that needs some attention. But I'm pleased to be here with you. It's good for me to be with actual people in the flesh instead of the virtual people I spend most of my days with. I live in South Bend, Indiana, which is a couple of hours away from Biologos headquarters in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So most of the time, I'm alone in my basement office staring at computer screens, working with the content on the Biologos website. We think there are actual people out there who correspond to the numbers generated about our website on Google Analytics. At least we can run all sorts of reports that seem to indicate that. For example, in 2016, there were two visits to the BioLogos website from Greenland. <laughs> I'm not sure what else the folks in Greenland have to do, but only two of them came to BioLogos.org. There were 877 from Iran in 2016, and 3,573 from South Korea. And believe it or not, from Russia, there were six, 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 seven. <laughs> Still, that's a little bit creepy, don't you think? <laughs> Given what's going on in the news about Russia and computers. None of these were in the top 10 countries for visitors to our website in 2016. How many of those can you name? Turn to the people at your table. You have 60 seconds to come up with the top 10 countries visiting biologos.org. I'll give you a start. Number one. Sounds to me like there are lots of opinions. Number two, the United Kingdom. Number three, Canada. Number four, Australia. Number five, India. So here we have the big, uh, most populous countries with English speakers. Those may have come pretty easily. The next five I'm betting not quite so easily. Number six. The Philippines? I don't know why. Number seven, the Netherlands, which has a fairly substantial population of folks interested in science and religion, and maybe half of those came from Casper back there, but. Number eight, South Africa, more English speakers. Number nine, Brazil. There's actually a very large and growing population of evangelicals in Brazil. And it doesn't hurt that the word biologos in Portuguese means biologists. So sometimes we get emails. <laughs> we sometimes get emails in broken English asking for advice on how to take care of a sick iguana. <laughs> That's not a joke. That actually happened. <laughs> and finally, number 10, Kenya. Again, more English speakers. We're very pleased with the exposure that our website is getting. But of course, we would like more. Part of my job is to try to increase that traffic, and we've wondered about making a series of cat videos, but that's <laughs> kind of hard to pair with our mission. We just need a way to get more people enticed to click on the titles of our blog posts and articles. You've probably heard the term clickbait for this sort of thing. And the trouble here, again, is, is that our content doesn't lend itself very well to clickbait, but we've been thinking about some ways that we could make our titles sound a little more enticing without giving up on what our content is. And I'd like to get your feedback on some of these clickbaitish titles to see uh, whether they have any promise. So here's, here's one. How about this? Population of Homo sapiens migrates from Africa to Europe, meets Neanderthals. Don't let the kids watch what happens next. <laughs> if you know something about that encounter, you'll know why. Or, 
what about this one? The ancient Near Eastern cultural background that biblical literalists hope you never discover. <laughs> the dramatic movie trailer voiceover, I think, helps that one, maybe. Or how about a listicle? You know, about those posts with a numbered list of things you just can't seem to ignore, like seven books every intelligent person should read. I just can't seem to pass that up. I got to find out what those are, right? Well, this one's a little bit long. <laughs> the content gets a little repetitive, but we think it might be interesting to some, and we'll see what you think. 100 million ways your DNA differs from chimpanzees. You won't believe number 582,413. <laughs> if you're wondering, I think it's guanine, but I'm not entirely sure. So it's fun to joke about this stuff a little bit, and some days it's only laughing about it that keeps us from crying. <laughs> we know this is serious business, perhaps even with eternal consequences. And when stakes are that high, people can get pretty passionate. And it turns out they're not all passionately in support of us. We often hear from our critics directly via comments on our blogs or emails to us, or more indirectly, when they write about us on their websites. And we get it from both sides. There was one day last month when I was featured on the blog of the prominent atheist, Jerry Coyne, who uh, didn't care much for the review I wrote of the movie Silence, thinking it was just silly. And then within 24 hours, the young earth creationist Ken Ham devoted part of his weekly Facebook Live broadcast to criticizing my new textbook. It's interesting that these two diametrically opposed voices seem to agree on one thing. If you accept evolution, there's no longer any point in holding on to Christian faith. It's what I'd like to explore with you a bit here this afternoon. And the title of my talk comes from this poem by William Butler Yeats, which was written in the aftermath of World War I, the war to end all wars. It seemed that society was falling apart, and we're like a falcon that whirls round and round its falconer in gyres, but has now gotten too far away from the center to be able to hear his voice. Then things fall apart. The center cannot hold. For Yeats, the war destroyed any coherent vision of society that held things together. For many people today, both Christians and non-Christians, evolution plays the role of the war to end all wars. If we accept it, they think Christianity cannot be sustained. They fear our faith will fall apart. There's this idea that the core of Christian theology is held together by a particular view of Adam and Eve by the position that humans were created separately from the other animals, by a God whose actions are only understood as miracles, and by the belief that creation was originally perfect. Then along comes evolution, calls these into question, saying you can't get all of humanity descending from just two people, and that human beings have common ancestry with other animals if you go back far enough, and that gaps in our understanding of the natural processes are rapidly being filled, and there never was a time when created things didn't die. This is hard, right? There are real concerns here that we can't just wave away. Does the center hold? Can we hold on to Christian orthodoxy when we accept evolution? Or do we have to opt for some stripped down version? It's not my answer to that question that should interest you. You already know I'll say that it's gonna be okay. Unless there's a surprise twist and I end my talk by tendering my resignation, <laughs> announcing I've taken a position with answers in Genesis. Wouldn't that make for a memorable moment at this conference? <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. I do think the center of Christian faith holds, even in light of evolution. But how do I get there? 
How can we explain this to family and to friends or to critics on the one side who think we're superstitious and silly for holding to faith in a scientific world or to critics on the other side who think we have dangerously compromised our faith and will be held accountable for leading others astray? Can we make a reasonable case for evolution and Christian orthodoxy? I want to consider in very brief fashion these four topics that have been stumbling blocks for people in accepting our position of evolutionary creation. What we'll see is that the criticisms from both sides accept the same line of reasoning to reach very different conclusions. Here's how that sort of thing can work. Prepare yourselves for a little refresher from logic class. We can frame their criticisms as chains of reasoning that start with an if-then statement. If A is true, then B must be true, and then C must be true, and then D must be true, okay? For example, if the federal government outlaws barbecue, then the locals will be very upset. I hear them already. And then there will be political candidates funded by the barbecue lobby, and then Texas will secede from the union. That ramped up rather quickly, I know, but one group of people might accept this line of argument, but think and really believe that the barbecue ban is coming. So they really think that the secession of Texas is imminent. Another group of people might accept the reasoning, but think there is no way Texas will ever secede. So they must go back to the beginning of this chain and deny the first step, right? Because both those groups believe that once you start down this path, you inevitably end up with the conclusion. But there's another possible response here. You might claim that the reasoning is faulty at some point, so that you could accept the starting point but not be pulled all the way to the conclusion. And notice that within this latter group, different people might think different links in the chain are the wrong ones. So there may be internal disagreements among them, but they still agree that the conclusion doesn't follow. Maybe some think there is no barbecue lobby, so that's just wrong. Or others might think, well, there is a barbecue lobby, but it's not powerful enough to get Texas to secede from the union, or whatever. You've got the idea here, right? So let's apply this now to our uh, problems, to the four areas. So first, with regard to Adam and Eve, there's often an argument like this. If evolution is true, then we didn't all descend from just two people. So there's no Adam and Eve. And then we couldn't have, origin, ha, couldn't have inherited original sin, so there is no need for a savior. I'd suggest that the real concern for Christians and for Christian faith is here at the end of the chain of reasoning. And because that is unacceptable for our faith, too many think they have to deny the starting point of this chain of reasoning. Whereas our atheist critics accept the starting point as obviously true and think that means our faith is ultimately undermined. But does this really follow? Can we accept the starting point and not be pulled through to the conclusion? I think we can. Yes. If evolution is true, then we didn't all come from just two people. But I'm not so sure the next link has to follow. There are some in the Biologos camp who think that Adam and Eve are symbolic and not historical individuals. But there are others who accept the science of evolution and still think there are ways of holding to a literal pair that is consistent with science and scripture. We'll explore some of those tomorrow morning. And then the next step is even more tenuous. I don't think we want to talk about inheriting original sin now as though sin is somehow literally encoded in the DNA we inherit, such that if we could just learn which sequence of nucleotides it is, we could change that with the new CRISPR technology and rid the human race of sin. I don't think we want to link this to biological inheritance in that way. But even if you go all the way down to the last link in the chain, you could still say, hold on here, something has gone wrong. It may be difficult to say exactly how and when sin entered the human race on evolutionary terms, but it's not controversial at all to say that it did. We all sin. None of us doubts that, right? And our inability 
to tell all of our history in detail does not prevent us from understanding our current condition. We sin, so we need a savior. There's good, fruitful conversation to be had about this argument, some of it here at this conference. I don't think we need to throw in the towel here. Next one, if evolution is true, come on baby, if evolution is true, then we have common ancestry with other forms of life. And we can't say exactly when human life began. So we're no different than other animals. Well, if evolution is true, then yes, there is common ancestry. Does that mean we can't say exactly when human life began? Some people say no, we can't. It's problematic in the biological sense to say that one generation of non-humans suddenly gave birth to little human beings. It just doesn't work that way. The boundaries are blurry. But there are others who say theologically there was a definitive break, a time when God breathed his breath into those homo sapiens and made them fully human. But even if you accept that line, I just don't see how that forces us to conclude we're no different from animals. BioLogos has started in on a new project on the topic of human identity. I've been doing a fair amount of reading on this over the past six months, and I have to tell you, you don't have to invoke theology to make a case for human uniqueness. There's a very strong case to be made from a host of disciplines, and often with non-Christian scholars as the leading voices, that there's a remarkable difference in kind between us and other animals, not just a difference in degree. But the tricky thing here is to realize that the capacities that set us apart, morality, language, reason, and so on, are dependent on other components of behavior and even brain structures. And, and these components do have evolutionary stories. So we find hints or precursors of them in other species. But that doesn't mean we're just modified apes or that we're just our genes. God entered into a special relationship with us. We are unique. We bear his image to the world. Next, if evolution is true, then there are random elements to the development of life. Praveen just talked about this. That means, whoops, got to get this there. If evolution is true, then there are random elements to the development of life. That means that God does not guide or direct the process and then there are no miracles. So at best, we're stuck with deism or a distant and uninvolved God. Okay, if evolution is true, then yes, from the perspective of science, there are some random elements to the process. Does that mean God doesn't guide it? Some say that God is responsible for causing the mutations, or at least the crucial ones along the way to keep things on track. Others think God has set up the laws of evolution from the beginning to produce creatures like us, and that it's not really all that random. That's a really interesting area of inquiry, but I'm more concerned here about these next steps and the feeling that if God isn't constantly intervening, then we can't believe in miracles like the resurrection and we might as well be deists. The key to seeing the problem with this reasoning is to recognize that scientific explanations are limited that they don't tell the whole story. The best illustration of this is still the one John Polkinghorne made famous about the boiling tea kettle. If we come into a room and see a kettle boiling, we might ask for an explanation. Why is the kettle boiling? And the scientist in the room might say something like, well, the electrical circuit was closed, which caused electrons to flow through the heating element, which conducted heat to the kettle, which increased the kinetic energy of the water molecules, causing the vapor pressure of the liquid to exceed that of the surrounding atmosphere. That's a good explanation. It's right, I think. I checked on Wikipedia before I put this up there. And in no part of that scientific explanation do we have to say, and then a miracle happens, so we understand the natural process pretty well. But it doesn't tell the whole story of what's going on in the room. For someone else there might answer our question, why is the kettle boiling, with, I wanted a cup of tea. That personal explanation addresses a very different dimension of reality. And it's not invalidated when we learn the scientific explanation 
of the process. We just have a better, bigger understanding of reality. In the same way, I think it's perfectly legitimate to say theologically that God created me in his image, that he knit me together in my mother's womb, as the psalmist says. But we also think my parents had something to do with it, don't we? <laughs> to be sure, we could ask them since they're sitting right over here, but that's kind of awkward. It was a long time ago, and I guess we don't need to think about that now. The point is that just as we know the scientific story about how each of us as individuals came about, and that doesn't negate the theological dimension of God's involvement, neither should the scientific story of how our species came about negate the theological dimension of God's involvement in that process. Finally, we get to the last one. If evolution is true, then things have been dying since the beginning. So creation could not have been very good. That means God is responsible for evil. For many people, this is the hardest one. But it isn't a new problem. For all of recorded history, humans have pondered the problem of evil. And I'm not convinced that evolution makes it any worse. There's a picture of creation many people have according to which everything was originally perfect and unchanging. But I'm afraid that's a cartoon at best. It bears little resemblance to the scriptural narrative even. God's creation was good, even very good. But after that, after that, the first, sorry, but after that, I lost my place. God's creation was very good, but after that pronouncement in Genesis 1 of God saying, this is very good, the first thing God tells the people he created is to fill the earth and subdue it. That means God didn't originally create the way he intended things to be. He could have snapped his fingers and made a world that was already filled and subdued, but he didn't. Instead, he created us and instructed us to do that. That seems to suggest at least that God delights in the process of things coming to be what he wants them to be. And it states unambiguously that he wants us involved in that process. Now we see through a glass darkly. That's the lesson at the end of Job when God finally speaks and says, who are you to instruct me? Where were you when I did all this stuff? But in the vein of suggestion for how we might try to understand, I'll offer that God is not looking to save us in order to whisk us away to some far away heaven that's unconnected to this created order. If that's what he wanted, he could have just made that from the start. Instead, he has saved us so we might function as we were intended to, as his image bearers and rulers in his kingdom now and in the new heavens and the new earth that are to come. And thus he's embarked on a project of shaping us to be who he wants us to be. And this applies to us as individuals as each of us has a story of our spiritual journey to tell. But I think God has shaped us as a species as well. Call it the spiritual journey of Homo sapiens. And maybe the evolutionary struggle is the only way to develop moral beings like us. Maybe it can't be done for us. Maybe God can no more snap his fingers to create morally mature creatures than he could to create free persons who are incapable of sin. These are contradictions in terms. We become morally mature only by being involved in our own moral formation, by making decisions with moral implications. And this requires challenging environments where decisions have serious consequences. So perhaps our capacity for moral responsibility was forged from processes that included pain. Then this is not senseless pain and gratuitous violence, but consistent with the cruciform nature of creation. It's ultimately redemptive as God transforms all of creation, even the hard parts. 
and is working all things together for good. The Christian hope is not in some fabled, perfect past, but in the transformed future, the new heavens, the new earth, the kingdom of God. I know that doesn't solve the problem of evil, particularly for those who are going through some of those parts. But I think it suggests that the evolutionary creation model has the resources to grapple with it, at least as well as other positions. In conclusion, I want to affirm with our critics, particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ, that it's good to be concerned about theology. We don't take these issues lightly, but neither do we think we can take the created world lightly. And when it so clearly says that evolution is real, we've got to allow that to be in dialogue with our theology. I've tried to show that in this dialogue, the center of Christian theology holds. I genuinely believe this system we call evolutionary creation can be articulated in a consistent and coherent manner but ultimately, I hope your faith is not in a system, a human-made construct by which we attempt to make sense of these things. If the center of our faith holds, it's because the center of our faith is a person. We see in that marvelous passage in Colossians 1 that it's Christ who holds all things together. And because he took on our flesh, our DNA, there's a savior for our sinful condition. That allows us to bear God's image to a hurting world. And we can affirm that God acts providentially through Christ in ways that science can describe and in ways that science can't describe. All of creation will be transformed and we are being transformed to participate with Christ in his kingdom now and in the world to come. These things are true no matter what the history of our flesh. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, not even evolution, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Amen.